I'm coming here, for those of you who don't know, haven't heard yet, after 30 years, Tisan, which is a long time, right? And it's not for lack of love or interest. I tried to come a couple of times. I was in Lebanon and the Israeli-Lebanese war broke out and destroyed my plans and other things, you know, the tidal wave happened in Colombo. It was really funny. Um, and so this time I was in Qatar and Doha, they invited me for a paper and I was able to piggyback off that. That's why I applied for that actually. I said, if I get as far as Doha, I can go to Karachi. And so here I am, I made it. And then I said, I was asking my friends, I said, you know, I'd love to have an opportunity where I can share with the people, with the community, with my friends, what I have been doing for 30 years and why I haven't come. And so this is the wonderful opportunity, and I'm so grateful uh, for uh, the opportunity that was given. So I am um, someone who spends, has spent the last 30 years basically working on medieval Islamic maps. And I'm going to tell you the story of how I got involved. I'm going to tell you the story of how I believe Pakistan is involved, and I'm very happy to give this, have this opportunity to tell you all about that. And then I'm also going to be looking at uh, the maps of the Sindh, and we're going to, you'll see everybody is getting a little bit of a handout. It's a small four-page handout you should have. Uh, the first page will give you a little bit of a, a description. I'm going to go over it in the talk over what is Islamic maps, etc. And then the second page, we will uh, talk about this uh, map and this template of the world. It's coming up in the slides. And then in the end, we will focus on the Sin map. And then there's a place at the back, and I want everybody who wants to pitch in and decide you know, what's on this map and help us identify. And as part of this larger project, I'm trying to uh, fuel here, uh, which is the project on the SIN map. So that's sort of the trajectory. So I'm now in Idaho. And if you have never been to Idaho, let me just tell you this. It's exactly 12 hours behind. So it's 5 o'clock in the morning right now. This is pretty amazing, huh? Um, exactly 12 hours. In a nutshell, this is what I have been doing for 30 years, pretty much. And this is, the slide is not that new. It's a couple of years old. So you can sort of see the numbers behind uh, the different boxes. And I would have shown you a little bit more, but uh, you can see each one has like hundreds of images from manuscripts behind each one of these. And over the years, I'm a very intrepid person. I learned how to be intrepid in Pakistan. I learned how to be intrepid through my education at CJM. And I don't give up easily. Uh, so I have acquired something like 3,000, three to 4,000 map images, many that have never been published before. Uh, about 150 have been published, thank you, about 150 have been published in my book, which is available for sale if you'd like a copy. I think there are only very few copies left. Um, and um, I have many, many more to publish. And what I finally figured out after 30 years is that I'm going to be dead before I get this all finished. You know, you get, you, get into, you get into understanding that we have a human life. So now, and this is part of why I'm happy to come here, I am trying to share this material. I'm trying to encourage this material to be used. And we're talking maybe about setting up some kind of a project for the SIN maps and for university students and school students and anybody who wants to be involved, uh, free for all, please, Ajay. You know, we need everybody. It involves everything from place identification to archaeology to uh, GIS. Uh, we, have, we have possibilities for everybody. In fact, I've said, so I finished my dissertation on this material, but now I realize 50 to 100 dissertations, PhD dissertations, still exist in this material. It's very, very rich. 
and it is it has got on quite a bit and so if you have any interest in that direction do not hesitate to tell me and tell you about the different things but essentially um this explains in a nutshell i'm a i'm a very crazy addicted researcher i'm constantly collecting and looking for more stuff and uh, and so 30 years can go easily into into this work and that's where i've been Now I want to tell you a little bit about the story of why I think Pakistan is to be credited and I'm very happy and honored to be here to say thank you to all of you because I am who I am because of you and what you gave me. And uh, aside from giving me uh, a lot of um, strength and courage which I got through my school years and with my school friends. Um I also got a great interest in Sindh in Pakistan and in geography and in maps and so that's some of what I'm going to talk about but uh, some of you might spy yourself I think this was grade 6 in the junior school um and I I'm out there in the front and there's Rubina and underneath me is Manise and there's Huma and I can can anybody see in the middle are there any bombjis over here there's Laila bombji over there in the middle um this tanaz dalal is behind her um you know uh, uh, go, uh gosia is there at the right at the back uh you can spy yourself and i wanted to be fair although i spent most of my time at cgm i did have my my two year a level stint uh, there in uh, karachi grammar school um there's fifi right on the corner of that group uh and naomi and I guess that must have been the prefects group because we're all wearing those prefect robes. And then at the bottom is a picture of me. I think I must have been about 6 or 7 here. Um and this is probably my favorite habitation in, in my entire life. Uh, Kashmir Road 55 and Kashmir Road um near um uh oh good good one of the members of the this is coming now. uh you know where i spent something like uh 16 years of my life without moving which after you spend some time in the us and you move there was a time when i had a tally of 17 moves in five and a half years so i look back at that little rented house on kashmir road which ironically is now a school so wonderful that it got turned into a little elementary school um so yeah some of my school friends are here fairy i don't know if you can see yourself in the school picture over there but that's from grade 6 and then there's uh, kgs picture over there um and then of course we used to go on these exciting trips mohenjodaro I I have this album I brought it with me anybody who wants some more pictures there's some very unusual pictures in this album but I managed to scan these this morning so there is there we and the point being that you know my father was an army guy used to go for shikar to sindh and so always going out into the desert not knowing where the hell you are m- getting mapped as a result of that oops not knowing where you are sorry you know uh, uh, be be more concerned so and then um you know all these field trips and everything i think were really inspiring for uh, my work that i do with maps i was uh, very sick i was in hospital uh, from the age of i think 4 until 9 i had a very rare disease called nephrotic syndrome and my friends know about it because they had to deal with it in school i was gone every year for about 3 months in hospital continuing my work from the hospital bed and pa- the beauty of that was it focuses you on books and on jigsaws and i had these little jigsaws that were missing pieces and so i had to make the jigsaw with the missing pieces and i think that's part of the whole interest because these medieval maps i work with the one thing about them that's very striking is a lot of places are missing and they have they no longer exist or they've been forgotten so trying to figure it out is part of the the joy part of the challenge you know so um and then of course you know there's my friend and i also went on these uh, last i think one of my last trips we went to the 
Karakuram Highway and the Shandur Pass and, and you know, so the point being that Pakistan has influenced me through the opportunity of travel, of exciting discovery-oriented travel um, that makes it possible for one to discover things, you know. And since the nuns are here, I have not been able to reach uh, Mrs. Harun, uh, who, um, who really inspired my work. Uh, she was a draconian geography teacher. She cracked the whip on us. And the number one thing for her was the maps. You know, the better your maps. And uh, we won't say, but let me say, my maps were very useful to more than just me. Um, and uh, she, uh, I wanted to find her. I don't know if anybody knows where she is. Is she still alive? to say this is what happened to that girl who used to draw the excellent maps, used to give top marks to, she did this in the end. Okay. So what happened? After I left here, I, uh, went, to do a P I went to do a degree at Columbia University, and there I took a class with a man by the name of Richard Bullitt, who is a very famous medieval Islamicist. And like many before, we were, I was hooked. I went from international affairs and the UN uh, to the 9th and 10th centuries and never looked back. And, and I'm happy to answer questions on why and, you know, I just love it. It's just amazing. And then my own dissertation topic ended up as an accident. I was in, and I, actually somebody just gave me some, Hamid gave me some copies from, um, from Miller's volume here. Uh, I ended up uh, in the Columbia Library stacks with something that was sticking out. I pulled it out. I was just randomly looking, like I need a topic for my master's essay and for a class paper that I was doing. And these things were sticking out. And I sat there, and I remember it was like six hours went by with the lights going off all the time. And I found these. And I was like, what are these? You know. And then I started reading the names and realized that these curious looking things which don't to any of you look like maps, are actually maps. And it gets us into a very interesting semantic question between something that I'm very interested in these days, which is this um, dilemma that maps have between being mimetic and being symbolic. So we went through some period where uh, the maps were very mimetic, but now with GPS and all, have you all looked at your GPS recently? They're not very mimetic. They go with the solid forms because it's easier to navigate, right? So a little bit of, I like to play with things, you know? Yeah. That, that sort of, you know, why do we tend to go towards mimetic and ignore these, you know? So, so then I had to find the originals. And this took me to Istanbul, Topkapi Sarai. That's Topkapi Sarai there. Um, that's uh, the wonders of working in manuscript libraries where you forget the whole world and you're just sitting there looking at these incredibly beautiful objects. Um, and that's uh, the tea and the bache, you know, and so I became fluent also as a result in Turkish. I work in Arabic, I work in Persian, uh, something like nine or ten languages. As in, and again, I credit Urdu as the language that gave me that bilingual basis with the Arabic uh, and everything else. And then my Urdu master would be amazed, you know, because he always thought I was one of his worst students, which just shows you don't give up on your students. They could be the worst in Urdu, and then they could end up being experts in medieval Arabic and Persian and stuff like that, right? Um, and then I went to Soleimani Library also. That's also in Istanbul. It has a very, very big collection. They basically collected from all over Anatolia. And the reason that Turkey is so crucial is because they're the last major empire. And the way these empires work, they always want the beautiful material. So they go and they get it, right? So the battle, you know, the, the major battles happen. And one of the things that they get at the end of those battles is the, uh, the beautiful illuminated manuscripts, the murakka and all of that stuff, right? They, that's what they want. And so the Ottomans, especially Topka Pisarai, acquired some of the best manuscripts, the best stuff, right? And I became, as a result, a macro photographer because I had to photograph these things myself. Oh, and you see that bust over there under the lamp 
of other Turk, I used to sit under there and I used to be worried that it would fall on me and cut my neck off. I've done a 3D, a very nice 3D. We have some 3D readers if anybody's interested in trying out. I'm very into 3D these days. I'm very into VR and augmented reality and part of my idea of what I want to do with the SIN maps, I, part of what, my reality, what I want to do with the SIN maps is um, create a VR um, possibility where people even outside in you know the states or wherever can walk through these spaces and experience them so it's i'm a new vr junkie because i'm a photo junkie also uh yeah that's with the kahwe and the inner libraries and i wanted to share with you a distinction you see when the pakistan government gives me trouble and says i have no relatives anymore in pakistan and maybe i'm not entitled to have my papers and etc i think i need to pull this out for them i am only the third woman ever to be inside the Suyufi Mubarakeh. Has anybody been to Istanbul? Anybody been to Suyufi Mubarakeh? Any hands over here? Nobody's been to see the sacred collection in Istanbul? You have, right? Did you get inside, Hamid? No, you're outside. I'm inside. So the three women who get inside are Benazir Bhutto, Tansu Chuler, and myself. And of course, they went on dignified, dignitary visits, and I went as the researcher. And uh, by the way, that's another thing. If there's any students who are interested in this material, I have notes and data that nobody else has. And nobody knows that I have it. Because the guy I did this work for, Ekmeladin Isanolu, he ended up as the Secretary General of the Islamic Conference. I love him to death, a great guy, but he wanted all the books in his name. So he'd make other people write them, and then he'd put his name on it. So they don't know that all the footnotes in that translation of uh, Suyuf al-Islamiyah, the swords of Islam, are all mine. So if anybody wants to do a doctoral dissertation, I'm, this is the guy I was working with. He was my, my handler there. There is the, um, the um, Hirka of the Prophet and in, in that. Uh, it's inside. It's inside. You can only see it through a small window. And there's the swords. Uh, measuring, I measured them and all. So I have a lot of data. And then the other thing, you know, on the Tuesday in Topka Pisarai is the day when you don't have tourists and then you get the film stars and they were filming, a, they love filming their films on Janissaries and Ottoman, uh, you know, they, they made, so that's me and the Janissary film stars there. In the days when I looked uh, much nicer. Okay, so here's getting to the tradition. So if you look at this handout, you don't have to read it. It's, it's there for you later when you, if you want to check into it. So they're basically, um, it comes from, we can call it the earliest known atlas series in the world. Uh, the earliest extent is 11th century, but they were put down sometime in the 9th or 10th century. And they come from this series called Kitab al-Masalik al-Mamalik, which I abbreviated to KMMS. And they discuss details of the Muslim world and um, uh, the 21 maps, hence the sort of atlas nature of this thing. So there's a world map, and then there's 21 maps after that of different regions. And that's where the Sindh map falls. It's one of the 21. I have a theory that uh, the Islamic, and I mention it in my book, that we have to see Islamic cartography as sort of um, the ultimate in syncretic cartography because they're getting influences from all over the place. So you can see with the world map sort of a Greco-Roman influence with the regional maps. I think we're dealing with Sino, Chinese, East Asian influence because they did very, very detailed provincial maps. Uh, but nobody put them together with the geography like this. And it fits, right, our interest in geography that we would have the earliest maps, right? I mentioned Mrs. Harun, you missed that, I'll go back for you. I talked about how I owe her draconian geography teacher for all the interests in uh, and work with maps. She used to crack that whip. See, sometimes it's good to crack the whip, right? Because down the road, that time we don't like it, but then down the road, maybe it might be your life. So these maps are world, Arabian Peninsula, Persian Gulf, Maghreb, Andalus, basically North Africa. I've written on that. Um, you can find all my work. I should have put it on the notes, uh, academia.edu, if you write it down, academia.edu, and you search my name. 
a lot of my articles are available for free there. You can download them. And very often they're beautifully done and illuminated like this. This is a Timurid copy. So among the other things that I've become, I've also become an expert on Islamic art history and dating and provenance. Uh, aside from being also, you know, an expert on the manuscripts and the history, um, the philosophy, I use a lot of philosophy in my work. Uh, the one tragedy we have, and it's, you know, it's one of, the, one of the downsides, but also one of the exciting things about working with manuscripts is you have, you often are missing things, you're missing copies, so you have to figure out what was missing. Hence the jigsaw puzzles in the hospital with the missing pieces, also along with Mrs. Haroon and all sorts of things helped me, helped me get into this. So it's very, a lot of fun. Um, and what I've done is because of the earlier work that was done by Miller, which was shared with me earlier, uh, by Hamid Khond, one of the problems with his work is he misdated the collection. His dates are all wrong. And when I figured that out, I went to the libraries and I said, I have to redate this collection. So that's the other major contribution I've been making, is I've been redating this entire collection. Um, so yes, and all, you know, I think Pakistan should get credit for it. It's not just me alone. So here's an example of a world map. I don't know how carefully you can, you can see that, but can you see in the seas there, there's like fish and snakes and um, very beautiful filigree gold work on lapis lazuli background with gold. Um, really gorgeous piece, pieces. And if you go to the second page of your handout, you will see there's a bit of a translation there of that world map. So of course you're saying, what the heck, this is a world map. Remember I told you we have to leave behind the baggage of mimesis and think in symbols? And in that case, it puts us in touch with GPS now. Um, the other thing you have to think about is this is a world before the discovery of the Americas, or a world in which they don't care about the Americas, but certainly they they uh, don't think much about Europe. So if you start to look at this, at this map, you start to see some of the basic outlines. One of the things that's really important, and I know this is very, very difficult for everybody, but I will not change the direction of the map because I believe that we are too north biased. We spend all our time looking at maps with north on top. Why? Look at it with south or east or west, you know, your GPS is not always looking with north on top. So I get all my students when I teach my map history class, the first thing I do in the first class is break that paradigm and force them and I tell them go home and take any map you have and put it in any other direction but north and keep it on your wall for six months like that and start seeing the world differently. Uh, it's very, very important. Uh, and if you do, then you'll start to see, and I'm going to get into this with you, but you'll, I'm going to move away from the mic a second, but you'll start to see how the centered area there, that's the Arabian Peninsula. And you have, yeah, I know it's hard with the mic. It's the head of the bird, but I have to bend over. So it's the head of the bird. They don't know what to do with me. Yeah. Okay, so it's the head of the bird, like that, with one wing over the top, that's Africa. And then the bulge on the side, that's Asia. And then coming down, and then you see that little thing coming out of the back, that's the tail. So Europe is like a tiny little tail. And you, you can understand when you work with these maps, why they didn't really care about Europe. I mean, look at it. It's a maroon little tail, who cares about it? What did the Muslims really care about? What did the Muslims really care about? Africa, right? If you, if you want space, if you want territory, if you want land, you want to go to Africa. So that's part of the information you get from these maps. Um, I need to go down, I want to show you, sort of you see if you look in that uh, mag the thing translation, this is the encircling ocean, the blue that goes around. And that too, do we have an encircling ocean today, folks? What do you think? Do you think we have an encircling ocean? You think we have an encircling ocean? Yes, of course we do. You've been brainwashed into thinking there are separate oceans, there's the Atlantic and the Pacific, it's all one. If you look in the right direction, you'll see that uh, they meet. And this is just nomenclature. 
So we still live in a world of an encircling ocean. And then the hook coming in from the left, that's the Indian Ocean. At the bottom, with the sort of arms going out, that's the Mediterranean. And then you have the Nile up there, the Bosphorus down here, the Aral and the Caspian Seas. And I've actually been working. And then you have the, the Indus. You can see that kind of like a whisper coming over. I wish I could point. I don't know what to do. Can I get the stairs here? Maybe if I could actually go and, and point for them. You can see this little whisper here on the left. That's the Indus River, uh, right with Sindh. And then the one in the middle there, Tigris and Euphrates. And you can see Iraq. Uh, oh, the, the stairs are going to be moved. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so I think you, thank you so much. I think, I think you can, I think you can see this, right? So this is the, this is the Indus here, Indus River. So, um, and this is Aral Sea, Caspian Sea, Mediterranean, Nile, Bosphorus, marooned triangle for Europe, Indian Ocean, along with the Red Sea here, uh, Arabian Peninsula. And this particular one, Makkah, is marked, but usually they don't mark, um, uh, places, individual places on the world map. Usually it's just the uh, regions. Okay, let's move on. You'll see a little more description. So the world loomed large, lapis lazuli and gold um, is this one. And I've worked with a number of very fancy pieces which were definitely done for um, a sultan. But I have also worked with the simpler pieces. And one of the things that I discovered in the redating, little esoteric information here, the one on the right is um, an Akkoyunlu copy that was probably made, it has a dedication to Mehmet II who conquered Constantinople. And I think that he had simpler copies made because he was establishing libraries after the conquest of Constantinople. So he had these libraries copies made. And this ends up creating something I call the Ottoman cluster. So another way to understand the way in this which works is um, blue equals sea, white equals landmass, world pre the discoveries in the Americas, and I said encircling ocean and south on top. So what do you do? Since we all work with mimesis, uh, take a map of the world, cut off the Americas. Everybody loves this so much, right? Just you know, forget about the Americas for a little while. Um, and then, if you put it up again, this is another version of one of the copies that Mehmet ordered for the library. You start to see with the simpler version, you start to, start to somewhat see the connection, right? And you can see one of the big things there is the overextension, overextension of Africa, uh, which happens here in this and doesn't happen here. So uh, you have to account for that, and that's coming in the Greek tradition, you have the overextension of Africa. And also, it's to do with sailing. They weren't sailing all the way down there, so they didn't know yet. And then, one day, and this is one of those things that I've never been able to replicate properly again, so my book even doesn't have this. It has a version of this. I was just fiddling with that map and twisting it, and, and I, will, I, I didn't do anything. I didn't add any. just skewed the projection, and you can start to see how once you get the overextended Africa, you start, you know, you have to think, these things were put down. Today to us, they look silly, childish. But we're talking before anything like this existed, right? There's nothing like this before. So, yeah, uh, translating the world map, and that's what you have in your hand, and you can start to see all the places that are marked. You can see, you know, it goes all the way to China, Tibet, India, all the Iranian provinces are marked, Asia, and then in Africa we have uh, Abyssinia, land of the Zanj, uh, Ethiopia, and uh, Buja I've written on, and it's that's in the book, and there's some specific places marked, but this of course is in the world map, and one of the things that um, Mrs. Harun didn't get us to think about, but I've had to think about a lot, is when you make a map, you have to make choices because a map is a certain size. You know, you cannot fit everything in it. This gets to Borges and Borges's idea and my idea of what I want to do with the Sin maps, which is the only real map is a one-to-one -one map. 
But of course, if we have a one-to-one -one map, the map would be the size of the world, right? So when you have smaller maps, you have to have choices about what you put in and what you don't put in. And those choices are made for a reason. And a historian can get into the background of that choice and start asking why this and why that and why the other. So one of the things is there's a place called the Buja, which is right here and it's repeatedly mentioned on the maps. It's in my, it's in my book. And I thought, well, nobody's, you look for the Buja in the history books and they're not even present. Why are they on this map? You know, limited space, you're gonna put something that, and this is what these maps do. They give you a shout to something people have forgotten about. So I started chasing the Buja and found they still exist. Poor guys, they're like the Kurds of East Africa. They're divided among uh, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and, the, and um, uh, that area of the, you know, East, East Africa there. They're across a number of borders. And everybody's trying to get them and convert them and there, there's, everybody's after these poor guys. And everybody knows about them, but everybody has forgotten them. So how many of you know Fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear, but Fuzzy Wuzzy had no hair, so Fuzzy Wuzzy wasn't Fuzzy Wuzzy? You've all heard about this? Do you know who they're talking about? The Buja. That is Rudyard Kipling. So among other people, even Rudyard Kipling immortalizes the Buja, but nobody knows who they are. And yet we all know them. So it's this wonderful twist. Okay, um, let me move on. I have a lot to do and I'm sure I'm running out of time. Here's some more. This is the Ottoman cluster. I'm going to skip past this because I've already sort of discussed this. Now here's a funky one. I love this. This is the 1285 uh, Mamluk Egyptian world map. And, uh, and yeah, I've got some data that comes along with this. 1500 maps. They range from 11th to 19th century proliferate from about the 13th century onward. Copies are made all over the Islamic world. And by the way, if any of you has ever encountered one of these copies, please do let me know. I should have put my email over there, but I think we can make it available to everybody if you sign up. Um, I'm always hunting these, uh, so if you know of any copies of... So one of the things is they get ignored because of the so-called lack of mimesis. Everybody puts them down, but in fact, they're amazing. Uh, and schematic, geometric, right, iconic ideographs, if you want to think about them, right? That, that in a way, maps are ideographs, right? They're ideas of space. And then, you know, visual representation of medieval Muslims and their perceptions of the world. And it's so much fun because they're like windows into the world of the time period, so you can write about them and discover new things and, and, and become famous. I've become sort of famous on the crazy things that I do with these maps. But before I go, actually, go back, I want to... I want to show you why I'm so fond of this map. Can you see right here? I don't know if you can see this there. It's a chain. And it's a chain across the Bosphorus. And there's a very famous story about how, and in fact, if you go to Istanbul, you'll find the old chain that the Byzantines used to block the Bosphorus from attacks. When Mehmet II attacks, um, and takes Constantinople, he has to take the ships on the side around the chain. This Mamluk map actually shows the chain. It's amazing. It's just incredible. Um, I'm very angry with the Russians for many reasons, other than buying Trump, um, which I don't really care about. But this Aral Sea here, anybody know what happened to the Aral Sea? The Russians have the distinction of killing a sea. So that puts them in criminal range, as far as I'm concerned, that they can kill the third largest freshwater lake in the world. And you know they killed it because of cotton farming. They decided they wanted to try growing cotton, so they killed the sea. If you just look at it, you can see. And that's a marking for the Buja and the location of the Buja. Okay. Moving on. Um, there's another thing that's very, very unusual about these maps. And it sort of goes with what I teach, the way I teach my students. You know, we think that progress is always a straight upwards, but it's not. It's a lot of going up and down. For instance, I teach the history of Islamic technology is one of my classes, and in a general opening class, I talk about how bad the chair has been, what a terrible invention the chair was for the human race. 
most of your back trouble and every hip trouble and everything is related to these horrible things called chairs that we all use regularly now. But here you can see this map is the earliest, it's the 11th century. And you can see a mimetic, this is the Mediterranean, this is the uh, Italian peninsula, the Peloponnese, the Bosphorus and Constantinople. Um, you even have like some very unusual African kingdoms that have disappeared over there. And this one is Mughal and it's from the 19th century. And so it's become, it's gone from being this earliest mapping tradition to being sort of an object of art, right? And, and you've got these fiery lips that are the, 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 the mountains of the moon where the Nile finds its source and stuff. You've got them here, but they're just not fiery here, right? So it's very interesting, the, the changes that come with the different copies. It's a lot of fun. You, you can see what I've been doing for 30 years, right? Uh, myth and fantasy, uh, a jive, a wondrous tradition. It gets into encyclopedias. Um, it's just quite amazing. It's, it's so much fun. And then I look at roots. As I was saying, I was looking at the roots of what brings about this tradition. I also look at you know Iranian roots and all sorts of roots because I really think that we have to see that. The other thing I look at is what is the connection with the medieval European tradition. So on your left, you have the classical medieval European TO map of the time, which is a T. It's a, it's, a, it's a T in an O. So the O is the representation of the encircling ocean. The leg of the T is the Mediterranean. And uh, that's the Nile. That's the Bosphorus. So you can see how they could have taken a simple world map like that and how the Muslims built on it, right? So this is sort of the T and the O here, but they add the Indian Ocean, Asia, that's their expansion. And you can see it so clearly. And actually the funny thing is, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm working on a book, I'm gonna be writing a book on what is Islamic about Islamic maps, because medieval European sounds very secular, but actually they're the ones with the Christ-like Eucharist world maps, and the Muslims are the ones where they're actually legitimately laying out, you know, think this is before satellites. How did they even get this? It's amazing. It's incredible. So, uh, here's some more. So this is another major discovery of mine. Um, so this is a, a medieval European TO map uh, labeled in Arabic. And I've identified it to a very famous uh, Arabic geographer. And that's a, and I've also identified another, well, I think when I come in conjunction with this, that one stops. Um, I've identified another manuscript as something that Frederick, the great emperor Frederick II from Sicily used and consulted as a child, as a prince. So it would have influenced his mind view and he becomes this big conqueror. So to what extent did Islamic manuscripts influence emperors, European emperors, right? Are we? How much? What time? Oh, okay. We'll try. Now, I've already talked to you a little bit about the world as a, as a bird, but you start to see it, and you can start to <coughs> see it sort of clearly. And so this isn't just about places. There's Neoplatonic philosophy wrapped into this as well. And in Neoplatonist idea, ideas, the bird is closer to the angels and therefore closer to God, right? And then us humans down on earth. And so there's this play between the bird and even, you know, in um, uh, Zoroastrian traditions, you know, the Ahura Mazda and uh, the form of the birds and the wings, you know, this idea that there's a heavenly connection you see reflected in the Islamic maps too. And uh, just so long as I don't leave you without some funky stuff, you actually had this, but we had to remove it from the handout. But it's a poem about the bird and the role the bird plays as uh, connecting uh, with the, you know, with the Arif um, and how it's a very beautiful poem by Ibn Sina 
about how the bird, she came to you and reluctant in her affliction, she will depart. You know, at first she resisted the corruption of the earth and then she grew accustomed to it and was drawn to it and kind of falls flat on it, right? And then you get the shape of the bird as the world. Um, she became attached to the D of her descent, moving from the sea of her center down to the sandy dunes until the W of her weightiness clung to her and she fell prostrate among their signposts and deserted campsites. That's Ibn Sina's poem. And then here's another one that shows you the importance of, so if you look at Neoplatonic philosophy, you see that you've got these different spheres and the, the great um, um, creator is in the encircling sphere um, and there are all these layers between them and the earth as mediating. Uh, so, well, we can talk about this down the road. I mean, I, I'm going to just go through some of my main ideas. Um, they're valuable ideographs of mentality. This, by the way, is the map of the Mediterranean, and I've spent a lot of time working on the Mediterranean. I have a book coming out on the maps of the Mediterranean, which is why I'm keen to leave the Mediterranean behind. Mediterranean scholars chase me all around the world. They're always trying to get information with me, but I'm, I'm done. I want to move to the Indian Ocean, so this is an excellent opportunity and invitation. I can get into how this is uh, a map. Basically, it's looking west, and those are the islands of Sicily and Cyprus and stuff. Um, I, can, I can sort of show you that if you're interested. So there's a peacock that's a mythical island called Jabal al-Kilal, um, and then uh, Sicily, Crete, and Cyprus. Bosphorus, Nile, main islands of the Nile, uh, North Africa, Spain. Uh, these are the three rivers, um, Jehun, Sehun, and uh, one near Tarsus um, that separate Byzantium from uh, the other part of the Islamic Empire. And this was the main sugur, the big boundary, the big frontier with the Islamic world and very fought over and fascinating by the way and i've actually been to ground there and found places by uh finding them by actually going to them which is what i'm proposing here uh, for the sin maps because there are a lot of mysteries and i would like to get students involved and so just various ways they can be unpacked to reveal different philosophy and theology and perceptions etc uh, here's a translation of the Mediterranean map, so you can sort of see. Uh, I've also, the, what I've got here, which we're trying to open for you, is a major encyclopedia that's done uh, using um, uh, Flash, uh, which is why they had to pre-open it, but I wanted to sh give you a sense of what goes on with it. Maybe we'll get it during the Q&A. We'll try. I, s I sent a link within, in an email. I've also got a digital database uh, manuscript here, some sample pages. Uh, yeah, some, that's the manuscript that I believe uh, Frederick looked at with his signature, which is a major find. And this is the earliest extent um, 11th century copy uh, that, um, from which I have put the map of Sindh that I want to discuss with you. So there's the map of Sindh. And I thought we'd have sort of an interactive discussion um, about this because uh, it's kind of funky and nice and uh, uh, I, I welcome your ideas and suggestions. Of course, there's some places that are very obvious um, that you might have heard about, I don't know, but there's a place called Mansura, Al-Mansura, uh, which used to be Brahmanabad, um, and that's shown on the map. So I'll take it there. This area here is, uh, that's Al-Mansura. So this is the Indus. Uh, this is probably the Sutlej, although there are a couple of others. Of course, we know that the Indus moves a lot, so it's, it's not something, you know, it's something that has probably changed over time, given how much it moves. Um, this whole area from here to up there is the, is the Makran coast area. There's a lot of places to be discovered in here. Um, and then it's trending towards, there's a parallel maps here for Kohistan and other places in, in Iran, and it shows you the connection with the Iranian provinces in terms of travel. Um, but there's a lot of work in decoding and identifying this map, and I'm hoping um, that we will be able to do this, and maybe we'll get students and universities, etc. if anybody's a teacher here uh, involved, um, and make this something uh, 
a matter of pride for Pakistan. And Sindh, and all my wonderful Sindhi friends. Uh, here, here's some more examples. I just put a few. This is from my Lightroom. These are various variations of the same Sindh map. Uh, and I'm hoping that we will be able to get this project off the ground and uh, worked on here. So. Uh, and then, yes, you see there's the template if you want to take some time. Now, here's something very interesting, and I was invited to work on this. And, and I just thought, now, here's a good way to see that some of these places are on this map. Um, and this is um, a, a map uh, charting. Um, uh, it's the Lower Indus Valley, 325 BC. But there's some parallels here, um, which, is, which is not specifically marked on the map, but Multan is. Multan is right. I don't know if you can see that. Anybody found Multan? It's right at the bottom. It's right here, Multan. In case you, in case you didn't know, Multan is, uh, has got a long legacy. Uh, but I'd like the idea of maybe trying to 3D and VR uh, uh, some of this, and then places that don't exist, you can use augmented reality to start to build them. And I think this would be a wonderful venue to rebuild the space of a map. And, uh, you know, I want to give you an example of how I did this. So what I want to do, actually, and this is what I've been talking to people about, is actually go out into the desert, look for places. And this is an example of a place that I found on the Mediterranean maps right here, Chevlik, which had never been found before. Um, and it was related to uh, Jabal Musa there and um, the splitting of Jabal Musa and a famous tunnel that Titus built to bring the waters down to the port of Piraeus to clean it uh, of silt. So, and it goes on and on, I'm not sure. There are two gifts from the trustees of Mohatta. The first is the complete volumes of 30 rags of Abda Parveen Singh, the Shah Jarag with English translations wow. of Latif. And the second is, the second is from Mohatta Palace's exhibition I hate to use the word rare maps and prints because these will not be rare to you, but drawing the line, Mahatta Palace Museum, the gallery guide from a previous Ooh, exhibition. Wonderful, it has the, the map, Al Idrisi map on the, on the cover. That, thank you so much, that's thank excellent. You. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity and uh, we're, hoping to, we're hoping to be able to um, um, do this project on the SIN maps here, etc.